Cosplay is such an inherently mad scientist coded hobby. We're always combining all kinds of different techniques and bad ideas to make really wild and unnecessary contraptions. Obviously, that's exactly what we're doing in this video. And because I refuse to make normal crafting videos, we are also going to be revisiting the late 90s classic Pokemon the first movie. I promise this will all make sense. I haven't watched this movie since I was a kid, so we'll see how it's aged. Do I still think Mewtwo was kind of justified? Will I still cry? Let's find out together. I picked up the materials for this project from friend of the channel Manhattan Wardrobe Supply. This is Foss Shape, which I've used before in my Korok cosplay. I thought I was going to use cardboard or foam for this to save money, but then I realized that, you know, I like working with Foss Shape. It's like 17 bucks. I'm going to love myself and grab the material that I'm familiar with. My first step is literally just drafting a circle that I know will fit in my checked bag suitcase. This cosplay project, in case you haven't guessed, is making a witch hat. That's the single sentence project goal for this video. Witch hat. Now, why am I making a witch hat? What am I cosplaying? That's a bigger question to answer, and we'll get to it later. My whole thing as a cosplayer is that I like making original designs that are really detailed and complicated and in-depth, and this is one of those. So for now, let's just focus in on the dope hat. The witch hat is going to be pretty simple and iconic because when you have a sort of complicated design with a lot of stuff going on, it's helpful to have visual cues that people can recognize easily without using a lot of brain cells. I do know I need to make this so it can detach for travel. I'm thinking snaps are probably going to be the best way to do that. Also, I want to think about battery packs because I know this hat is going to have some stuff going on and it is way easier to make those like boring practical engineering considerations now at the beginning as opposed to like when I'm halfway through making it. Foss shape is such a cool material because it has this very normal fleecy fabric texture before you heat form it, and then when you use a heat gun on it, it becomes very stiff. So I'm trying to give the brim of this hat a very like organic, floppy vibe that I wouldn't be able to achieve with cardboard. And honestly, y'all, this part of the process is like really just kind of vibes. I'm just sort of sketching what I think a hat will look like and making it mostly with the foss shape itself. The top bit is probably going to be a stack of a few different pieces. I think that's going to be the easiest way to get the really organic shape I'm aiming for. When you heat Foss shape, you really want to make sure to get the front and backside evenly heated, so it takes a lot of time to get it done right. Yes, you will absolutely catch me watching Dimension 20 in the background there. The Pokemon movie is only like an hour 15 and this whole process took way longer than that. But while we're here, you know, while we're taking our very first steps in the laboratory with today's contraption, let's also take a step down memory lane and begin to explore Pikachu's vacation, the first part of the first Pokemon movie. So Pikachu's Vacation is like, you know, the Pixar animated short, but with even less content to it, honestly. I love that as our heroes are approaching with their Pokemon, everything is just labeled Pokemon in like three different places. It's fantastic. I love it. The whole conceit for this little like mini episode is that the Pokemon are going on a relaxing vacation without their trainers and everything is kind of told via sight gag or the Pokedex narrator explaining things. You can't, you can't think about this too hard. Don't think too hard about the fact that Pokemon can like run their own vacation establishments. They have little Pokemon problems and they solve them in their cute little Pokemon ways. It's a lot of like child coded Pokemon trying to take care of the baby coded Pokemon. We meet some new Pokemon, some generation two guys, and I'll be honest, rewatching this, I was like, oh yeah, that's why I always had beef with Snubble. I never forgave them for being a fucking bully in this. <laughs> One movie. Of course I had a hard time learning to love Generation 2. I mean, this was their intro. They're being dicks. There's like a Squirtle and Meryl race sequence. There's like a Pikachu and Raichu fight. There's a lot of very American pop songs that are playing. So you know this isn't like your Pokemon anime. This is, we got a big budget on this one, y'all. Team Rocket's Pokemon are there inexplicably. I feel like the treatment of Team Rocket was so formative for me as a child because the way these episodic TV shows treated their villains, it's so interesting. The way these villains were bad and evil, but ultimately narratively incapable of causing major lasting harm. The way over time all of their like conflict and combat turns into like them having a, a handshake relationship, it's very formative. Absolutely, this is the egg of me being a lifelong villain apologist. The conflict between our new bully Pokemon and our beloved Ash Pokemon comes to a head when Charizard, world famous hater, gets his head stuck in a tube and they have to pull him out. They reuse the same shot of Charizard screaming like four times, which I truly respect. Eventually they get Charizard out, 
honestly, there's not a lot to love in Pikachu's vacation unless you are a child or a person who is, you know, experiencing nostalgia for the child they were when they first saw this, aka me. And I will say watching this, I kind of started to get why some adults had beef with Pokemon. If I were using this as an isolated case study, like there's just not a lot there. There's these really bizarre like screensaver inserts where there's just Pokemon kind of like going across the screen saying their name and I'm like, yeah, I get why the adults in my life were like, what is this? They just kind of walk. They're just kind of doing stuff. Or like there's one of them here and there's more of them here. There's more of them there. It's, it's silly. It doesn't mean anything. <laughs> I was confused watching it, so I can understand the confusion that adults in my life had, but more on that later. For now, look at this hat we made. So now we're taking the like outline of the witch hat and, and coloring it in basically. I've got some black canvas left over from literal years ago and I think that's gonna get the job done just fine. The process of figuring out how the canvas wraps around this like sculpture that I basically made with no real plan is pretty approximate. I'm basically like wrapping it around stuff and pinching it and then sewing it and then seeing what happens. Now that we're kind of up and running with the outline of the witch hat, I do wanna stop and say that the full concept for this build is what if lavender Town had a witch. That's right, there is a dramaturgical reason why we're watching Pokemon movies while we make this. My goal with this cosplay is to bring together kind of like homespun cottage magic vibes with inspiration from generation one Pokemon. I genuinely feel like there is so much to pull from the like late 90s, original 151 era of Pokemon that I'm really trying to keep this look grounded in the Pokemon from my childhood. And rewatching this stuff is making me feel very cemented in that decision. Once I've got the top part looking honestly exactly how I want it, it is time to add, you know, the old razzle dazzle. Of course, naturally. I like throwing LEDs into a project. I think they're fun and festive. I know a lot of people do it. They're right and they should do it more. And I'm doing it today. I think I forgot to get shots of it, but I did sew a little like spandex perch for the battery pack inside the top part of the hat. Initially, I thought I was gonna sew these LEDs in, but then I realized that's what the Lord invented hot glue for. I feel like a lot of cosplayers make the mistake of thinking you have to sew and you can't use hot glue because hot glue is like a worse and cheaper tool, but I'm here to be like, no, sometimes Sometimes hot glue is the way in the light. Let's put some respect on it. Even with hot glue, this part does really take a lot of time and I'm doing a lot of work with the lights on so that I can make sure that they are spaced evenly. Things taking a really long time is honestly kind of the running theme for this project. If you've watched this channel before, you might have already correctly guessed that last November's video about making a floofy petticoat was for this project. And I've actually been sewing the other parts of this cosplay pretty nonstop since literally December, but since I'm using a lot of historical techniques, it's taking 1200 years. So speaking of things with ancient timescales, let's jump into our good friend Mewtwo's journey. The whiplash any person would get going from Pikachu's vacation, which is like nothing, it's a screensaver practically, to like full-on Sauron whispering about the nature of the mysteries of life unhinged. I don't know. It's it's a wild ride, folks. We see, you know, this Pokemon Mewtwo waking up um, in their, like, laboratory cell, uh, breaking out, saying hi to the scientists. And to be totally honest, I had such a visceral response to the sound design of whatever is happening when Mewtwo is like, they're outside. Those voices. I hope we don't lose this one. They're outside. We can't lose this one. I think the sound design of this movie is actually incredible and we'll talk a lot about that actually. Mewtwo gets told that he's an experiment and he pretty immediately destroys the lab and kind of kills everyone. Our known villain from the game and anime, Giovanni, rolls up in a private helicopter, which is fantastic. Children are never too young to learn that if someone shows up in a private helicopter, they're automatically a villain. Mewtwo comes under Giovanni's control. We see Giovanni using Mewtwo's awesome power to like defeat other Pokemon and other Pokemon trainers, including Gary. It's a tie-in from the anime. We're getting tie-ins. I'm losing my mind as an eight-year-old. To be honest, I think this part would make a lot more sense to American audiences. It's basically just Frankenstein and that's kind of it. Giovanni does what villains do. He tells Mewtwo that he was only ever intended to be a weapon. Mewtwo says F that and leaves. We get some incredible CG titles and the movie starts. And here's the thing, you guys. Every YouTuber that's like things you never knew about Pokemon, 
I'm that YouTuber now because there were things I didn't know about this fucking Pokemon. I watched this movie with no further context or research. I wanted to have a very kind of like pure and unbiased experience rewatching it. But the moment I finished this movie with the power of an internet that I did not have in 1998, I found out about the original Japanese version of the Pokemon movie prologue. I'm sure this is really common knowledge for people that are like dyed in the wool Poketubers, but I had no idea about this. The American release edited out a 10 minute prologue before Mewtwo wakes up in the laboratory. This prologue was adapted from a radio play and deals with the story of Amber, the child daughter of Dr. Fuji, who was our mad scientist guy in the movie, who he clones into a clone named Amber too, who develops a friendship with a little baby Mewtwo before she dies again and Mewtwo gets put to sleep and roided out before he wakes up in the version we saw as American audiences. This is f***ing me up on so many levels, more of which we'll get to later. As a kid, honestly, I always found Mewtwo's story to be really relatable and understandable. And finding out that there was even more lore that four kids deprived us of is just... It, it changes so much of the balance of this narrative. I'm gonna be coming back to this because, man, I have opinions, but we gotta keep working on the hat. While we get back to sewing, since I don't have sponsors on this wee little channel just yet, I wanted to take a second and let you know that this video is brought to you by my really cool members on Ko-fi. My memberships start at just three bucks a month and every tier offers a ton of really incredible rewards. I know I'm biased. Like there's discord channels where I post all my work in progress stuff and I do crafting streams and there's early access for YouTube. And at higher levels, I make really cool stuff to mail to members. Most importantly for this video, the full design rendering for the Lavender Town Witch idea is up now for all my members. So you can see the full vision of what we're working towards. These monthly memberships help me keep making things. And from the bottom of my heart, I try truly appreciate each and every person who decides to support all of this with a membership. So we've got our lights on the brim of the hat, and to be totally honest, I am a little bit worried about the purple I chose looking a little bit cheap. I'm just worried it's not gonna look good with the rest of the fabric of the cosplay. If I were to go back, I maybe would use like a warm white, but it's what I did and it's on there now, so. Today I am pulling some wool from my stash. I am obsessed with this wool. I think I've had this in my stash since 2015 or something, and I've just never had a project that's quite right for it. Like it has so much depth and so many interesting colors. Ugh, I'm obsessed with it. And I'm gonna use this to make prairie points, which is definitely not the kind of thing that any normal person would recommend to do with wool, but I don't know, man, we're cosplayers. Prairie points are used a lot in historical garments and in quilting. It's basically folding up a square of fabric to make a triangle. The standard method of making prairie points would make a triangle that's a little too flat for my liking, so I am folding mine in thirds instead of in half. But for now, what I'm really doing is cutting a bajillion squares. The math looking at the circle we're working with says that I'm gonna need 66 of these prairie points. I know in reality, it'll probably be a bit less than that, but I'm still gonna make 66 of these just in case. Since I'm gonna be putting these prairie points all along the brim of the hat, they need to really hold their shape. So I am steaming the absolute crap out of them and pressing them like within an inch of their lives. That means it just takes a really, really long time to make 66 little triangles that'll totally hold their own shape. And then it's time to hand sew these bad boys on. The main reason why I'm hand sewing these and not gluing them is because, you know, the brim of our hat has a lot of curve to it. In some places it flips up and in some places it flips down and I really want the point of these little pointies to go along with that. Plus if I were gluing I would need to glue inside and outside. It would just be way too much. This is totally a case where hand sewing is the way to go. I really love the like slight variations in the direction of the triangles. It kind of reminds me of like a plant with a lot of leaves stretching to face the sun. As we make our way through another hand sewing portion of this hat, let's rejoin our heroes and actually start the movie portion of the Pokemon movie. So confession time, I think the first act is the best part of this movie. Like we open with our heroes, they get challenged to a battle by this random One Piece cosplayer who I don't think we ever see again. We're given a remix to the opening theme song with like a second verse and everything and honestly the power of this song can't overstate it. Tens, tens, tens. I think opening the movie in this way with basically just like a really slick Pokemon music video battle moment 
is so smart. It's literally inviting in the audience that's already been watching the anime to know, hey, this is still the world you know and love. It's gonna be a lot of Pokemon battles, but we're just elevating a little bit, you know? We're just taking it to that next level. We have a budget this time. Team Rocket is keeping an eye out as ever. They've got a lot of puns. This is one of the only animated appearances that I can remember of my personal childhood favorite Pokemon, Dragonite. My beautiful little baby boy with this little messenger bag, I can't. Our heroes get a holographic message inviting them to go to New Island, which is a it's a really great name for an island, y'all. We see Mewtwo in like a very sinister looking lair, magically summon up a storm with his little hand. We see Mew, the Pokemon that Mewtwo was cloned from, awakening in here somewhere. I love that the world of Pokemon is a place where this really ghibli ass looking windmill castle exists in the same world as like hologram postcards. We see Officer Jenny, and I wanna be very clear that ACAB includes her. Too bad, so sad. Obviously there's a really bad storm, no one can go anywhere, but the harbor manager is also here to deliver a prophecy in a really unidentifiable accent. She tells us all about a really bad storm in the past called the Winds of Water, which again, great naming conventions here, y'all. And apparently in this prophecy, you know, the tears of Pokemon restored the lives of those lost in the storm. And even as a child, you, you know what that means is gonna happen here. Brock sees a missing poster of Nurse Joy and has a moment where he goes, wow, she sure looks familiar. And I remember as a child, this being the moment that really had me in my like angry Redditor moment. This makes no sense in the context of the world. Brock knows Nurse Joy, of course she looks familiar. He knows all of her sisters. Like, what does this sentence mean? Yeah, bro, of course she looks familiar. You know her. What? Anyway, some slightly more prominent NPCs also, you know, ride their Pokemon off into the storm. I have just re-encountered this guy for the first time since childhood, and let me tell you, I'm convinced this man is trans. The absolute unhinged T-boy energy of riding your Gyarados into a storm. Fucking idiotic, and I can think of at least five people in my life that would do that. The Harbor Master gives this little speech that, like, honestly, it's so hard. She's like, to some trainers, this is just one more challenge. That's what sets them apart. It totally slaps. If you have the memory of an eight-year-old and have immediately forgotten that she literally just begged people to not go. I'm trying to make this not be a nitpicking video, but some of these... Come on, y'all. At this fabulous and fortuitous moment, the Vikings show up, naturally. There's a joke about how the Vikings are in Minnesota, and I remember being like an adolescent and learning it was an NFL reference and being kind of gutted. Team Rocket deserves like an eight hour video essay from me and every other gay person, but for now I just wanna say that like, if Team Rocket also made you gay, let me know in the comments. But that's actually like a genuine request because it, it really helps me out. One of the things I love about Team Rocket is they live in a world where the best course of action is always the most dramatic and the least practical. They could have hidden Meowth in some boxes or something on the ship, but no. They had to have a talking bow sprit statue. That was the way they had to go. Anyway, the boat sinks. We're having fun so far in the movie. It's hitting everything that I love about Pokemon. There's random lore from NPCs with strange accents. There's missions that are extremely high stakes for literally no reason. And there's so much really strong establishment of the anime protagonist sh the world of Pokemon is all about. So with some quick thinking and some water Pokemon, our heroes have solved the problem and arrived at the island. And you know, speaking of, of problem solving, What a good transition. Um, we, we've run into a problem, and it's that I only have this much of this fabric left. This is the fabric that I was planning on using to cover the underside of the hat. It's left over from my Not the Brave cosplay, and yeah, that's, that's not gonna work. I need something that's gonna go with the rest of the cosplay, so like a purple or a gray or a neutral. I want something like a little bit interesting to look at. I want something that will diffuse the LEDs nicely. I don't know, I spend a lot of time going through my stash and ultimately what I think I'm gonna end up doing is just using the brushed cotton that I am planning on using for redacted, some other stuff. I'm worried about it looking a little bit boring, but I've got some ideas for how we can fix that later. And I know at least the white will diffuse the LEDs in a nice way. I truly do not feel like doing all of the math to draft the donut that I'm gonna need for this. So instead I do eight trapezoids to make like a kind of approximate pizza. Once the donut gets stitched together, then I grab some cord to zigzag stitch over to be able to gather down all these ruffles. Cord is way less likely to break than just pulling on threads. I really like using this method for very long gathers like this hat. Also, honestly, I just love hand gathering. I think it's really fun and it lets you be so precise. 
I know that once I get everything all the way gathered down, it is going to look a little mushroomy. Let's let's address the mushroom elephant in the room. Mushroom hats are really big right now. They're really cute. I definitely watched some mushroom tuck videos while I prepared for this project. I'm definitely not aiming for the dome thing that the mushroom hats have. Like I want my brim to be very thin, but I think if you're just looking at it from the bottom, it'll look that way and that's fine. Maybe one day I'll make a mushroom hat. They look fun. As I'm getting this gathering down, I make an amazing discovery. When I use steam to like heat form the gathers to get them to set, it also kind of activates the hot glue I had on there for the lights. So it makes them stay in place even better. So I'm heat forming the gathers to get them in place. And I'm also hand sewing them down along the brim. And honestly, I did most of this process on my crafting live streams that I do for my members. I know I see a lot of people do kind of big chunky pleats on their hats, which is totally valid. But for me, I really like getting precise with it. I like hand gathering in a way where the fullness is super evenly distributed. I find it really satisfying and I think it looks so incredible as an end result. And you know, I used all that time hand gathering to reflect on what the f was going on in New Island. So we're on the island now. This very gothic looking woman uh, who we saw before approaches us. I remember when I was a baby cosplayer, I really thought about making this gown just because it's so weird and like iconic. We see Mew kind of hanging out doing some wholesome baby coated stuff, precious angel. There's a little musical theme that plays whenever Mew is like being sweet and innocent. And honestly, I think it's really beautiful musically. Team Rocket makes it to the island. Hello, they're capable, they can keep up. Original inventors of homosexual audacity, Team Rocket. We meet the other trainers who made it to the island unsurprisingly it's the slightly more designed seeming npcs mewtwo comes down says hello tries to get everyone on board with the whole world domination thing that he's very interested in and at this point where we're starting to really get into the whole evil clone thing it's really interesting to watch in 2023 and think about all of the kind of anxieties around dna there were in the 90s i don't have anything smart to say on it but it really does make me wonder if like we're gonna see a spike in like ai based art in the next couple of years, by which I mean like narratives where people are trying to grapple with like the future in terms of AI and if those are going to in 20 years be seen as kind of outdated in the same way that we look at DNA fears now, you know? I really don't think anyone is that freaked out about cloning these days because we know it's just not a big deal. I hope that in 20 years, those fears will seem just as silly and dated as DNA fears do. Team Rocket, beautiful and attractive um, plot devices make their way down to the laboratory portion of the castle. We got a lot of information that we sort of already got in the prologue, but more spelled out. We're hearing about how they're making something new and even more powerful than Pokemon. They're super clones. Back up top, you know, Ash challenges Mewtwo because the boy's head is just empty. There's nothing going on there except for catching them all. At this point in the laboratory, some clones of the Generation 1 starter Pokemon's final evolutions emerge from their tubes. And once again, the sound design is really good. I love the animation of them emerging. I think it looks really cool. And I want to pause here and underline this point, because American audiences, we see, you know, Charizard, Blastoise, Venusaur, and we're like, oh yeah, that makes sense. The prominent Pokemon, duh. But if you watch this in Japan with the original prologue, you know that these are actually Mewtwo's childhood friend Pokemon that he had become buddies with and then they died. So these are actually him reanimating the, the Pokemon that he loved who are dead. It's really fucked up. He resurrected his friends to do violence, you guys. Anyway, Mewtwo reveals his sick-ass stadium. It's kind of wild to see the sinister gothic, like, bio-warfare stadium and compare it to, say, the sword and shield battles, you know? Each one of these Pokemon goes up against their clone, and the originals each get their asses absolutely handed to them. Also, I love seeing Charizard just being a hater. I think kids need to learn that sometimes people are just gonna be fucking haters, and Ash's Charizard invented the genre. Mewtwo says that since his super clones won the battles, um, he's gonna steal everyone's Pokemon, because that's a cool thing to do. These absolutely terrifying Pokeballs appear out of nowhere and capture everyone's Pokemons. Not gonna lie, these things are horrifying. It's kind of super dark, actually. I love the sequence because you get to see all the kind of like ribbed bug thorax textures they put on everything. I just love the design of this layer. I think it feels really cool, like dark science magic while also being super biological. Unsurprisingly, when Mewtwo tries to grab Pikachu, our beloved poster child, never done anything wrong, Ash does jump all the way down into the lab to try and save him. Who can blame him? We love impulse decisions. Let's, let's revisit some other impulse decisions that are happening elsewhere.
So now that the underside is all covered, I do need to figure out a way to cover the raw edge there. And you know, I just don't feel like shopping, so I'm gonna go through my trim bin and make some decisions. I think I've got enough of this jute braid to make it happen. I think this is called jute. I could be wrong. I'm going with hot glue for this. I think it's easier to get big, wide curves like this hat brim to look smooth with hot glue, whereas with a ton of teeny tiny stitches, it might look a little bit wobblier. I'm grabbing the same canvas we used before and throwing that on top of the brim. I'm just gluing it down along the edges, and honestly, I hope that's not a mistake. The circle's a little uneven, so I go back and trim off the excess. I think I forgot to get shots of me sewing on these snaps earlier in the process, but this is how we're gonna take the hat apart. And since we obviously need those accessible, I'm cutting out little gaps in the fabric. Now, now for the raw edge on top, I was going to use more of the same jute braid, but I just kind of didn't like the way it looked with the canvas. It just didn't work. So as ever, we go back to the stash, and I'm actually grabbing some twill tape that I used for the sleeves of the shirt. The shirt video is coming soon to a theater near you, don't worry you didn't miss it. With the raw edge on top all the way covered up, we are in the home stretch finishing up this hat, and we're also in the home stretch finishing up these evil Pokemon laboratory adventures, so let's hop on over there. We rejoin Ash, like, in the depths of the lab, trying to get Pikachu back because he has one personality trait, and I can't blame him. Look at that little guy. Again, I love the biologicalness of this lab. Like, the robot grabby arms are so organic looking. They're really kind of creepy. All the Pokemon that Mewtwo stole get cloned before Ash can rescue Pikachu, and the machine conveniently blows up and releases all the originals. As you must expect by now, we get more puns from Team Rocket. And I gotta say, send in the clones is my current frontrunner for the best pun in this godforsaken movie. Mewtwo is fully villain monologuing up on the surface level, talking about how his great superior clones are gonna do really awesome stuff, and Ash emerges from the smoke to try and stop him, and I hate to say it, but the dramatic drumline use did make me laugh out loud as an adult. You can't do this. I won't let you. I thought this was so cool as a child, and it made me burst into laughter as an adult. It doesn't hold up. Ash tries to punch Mewtwo because, obviously, and suddenly Mew appears, and we get the iconic bouncy bubble sounds. Again, like, these sounds are some of my favorite parts of the movie. They feel really ingrained in me, and I want to give awards and accolades to whoever did sound design for this. We get some god-tier Pokemon dialogue. It's one of my favorite parts of Pokemon in general, when they just have a Pokemon say their name over and over again, and the humans are like, oh yeah, this is what they're saying. It reminds me of, like, hand-waving in D&D. It's like, oh yeah, you explain all of that. Done. And then we enter our MCU moment, where the only way to solve this is with a battle. Actually, I take it back. I'm watching this now, and this is this is way more artistic than a lot of Marvel movies. We get our famous montage of each Pokemon fighting their own clone, set to like a very soulful and very tragic song about fighting your brother. The lyrics aren't awesome, but the emotional impact is real. I really do think the inclusion of like American pop songs into the movie, and especially Pikachu's goddamn vacation, is one of the main things that makes this movie feel elevated from the anime TV show. But then the song cuts out, and we get into like some really sad orchestral music, the Pokemon are really not looking good, and we learn about how like violence is bad. Jesse and James tearfully promise to never fight ever again. Gay people love making dramatic resolutions to completely change their life and then immediately forget about it. It's me, I'm gay people. Specifically, Clone Meowth gives us a nice little speech about, you know, Meowth, Meowth, Meowth. Meowth, 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 which means that, you know, maybe we should look at what's the same and not what's different. Which is a message I personally have mixed feelings on, but we'll get to that soon. Anyway, the Pikachu battle is getting really sad. Like, really, really sad, actually. They really knew exactly what they were doing with the scene, and they did not pull any emotional punches. I know it's kind of a pun, but, like, that's the way I want to say it. Like, it hits really hard. God damn it. I'm gonna get there. <laughs> Oh no, you gotta keep going. You gotta keep filming, even though it's sad, even though it's sad that Ash died. Oh my God. And as we all know, because if you're anything like me, you will never forget experiencing this part in the movie. As our heroes are kind of realizing that they're never gonna stop fighting until someone dies, Mewtwo and Mew gear up to do one last big energy ball punch at each other and Ash gets in their way. Do you guys remember when children's movies just like had death in it? Do you remember that? I'm one of those people that doesn't like cry in their real life, but I cry very easily at movies and TV shows. I think it's been a few years since I cried for me, for myself. 
but like make me talk about Pikachu shocking Ash trying to wake him back up and I'm just there. It's so emotionally brutal because it's a callback to the anime. Pikachu shocks Ash to wake him up or to like, you know, just get someone's attention all the time in the show. So Pikachu doing that to no effect is like, oh, it's devastating. At this point, Pikachu's crying. You've seen the gif, all the other Pokemon start crying and then just like our silly NPC foretold, the tears magically fly into Ash and bring him back to life. It was a very short death for this children's movie. I think Iku-chan deserves an Oscar for <laughs> performance as Pikachu in this scene. She does so good. Anyway, Ash comes back to life. Mewtwo realizes that a human was willing to lay down his life for a Pokemon, and he's like, oh my gosh, I've, I've f***ed everything up. I'm gonna reevaluate my whole life. He says something about how he sees now that, like, your birth circumstances are irrelevant. It's what you do with the gift of life that matters. And I'm gonna take a second here to nitpick the script because I think this is a really weak way to phrase what just happened. Yes, absolutely, Mewtwo has learned something in this moment, but it is patently false to say that the circumstances of your birth are irrelevant even in the world of this movie. Like that's just not true. The circumstances of your birth have a lot to do with what every single character in this movie has done and has had happen to them. It's just a really poorly written line as you're kind of like wiping away the tears from all of that like really emotional stuff that just happened. The script and the dialogue was honestly a big part of the criticism of this movie. A lot of Americans really dunked on the clunkiness of some of these word choices. Those are some valid points as far as I'm concerned. This movie actually got mostly negative reviews in America. I really, really remember this as a kid, that most of the adults in my life could not get over the fact that a franchise that was predicated on battles chose anti-violence as its main takeaway message. The Americans who weren't little kids with Pikachu fever like I was said that the movie was basically a nonsensical marketing move with nothing of value. I've got opinions, but for now Mewtwo zooms off into the sky and we're not ready to zoom off just yet, so let's take a final look at the hat before we finish the movie. One of the last things I've got to do is throw together a little band for the part where the brim meets the top of the hat. I've been working on this for days and I don't know what they call the top part of the hat, the part that's not the brim. If you know, please let me know in the comments. This quilted gray jersey kind of fabric is actually the material that I used for my Not the Brave jumpsuit. I'm just throwing together a tube and then I'll figure out a way to drape it around that edge. Also for the inside of the brim, I am just wrapping the gathered fabric around the edge of the foss shape and hot gluing it down. I think I forgot to get shots of that part, so I'm very sorry. Which means we've officially made it to our last step, which is finding a way to make the white cotton look cool and less white cottony. We'll see how it works, but right now my idea is to use Dynaflow. This stuff comes from Jacquard and it's kind of like a paintable dye. I've used it in the past to get kind of tie-dye effects on t-shirts, like for my Flick cosplay. And I think if I play my cards right, it could bring a nice energy to this hat underside. Although to be honest, I really don't know what I was thinking doing this part in a white shirt. The thing about Dynaflow that's really cool but that does take some technique to manage is that it really spreads out on the fabric, especially depending on how damp it is. So I've got a spray bottle full of just water and I'm trying to sort of manage the way the dye is behaving and bleeding. And yeah, you know, I am doing this part with the LEDs on because I don't want to lose track of them in this paint job, but maybe this section gets a rating of don't be influenced by me. It's probably a really bad idea to be painting while the electronics are on. Don't do this at home, kids. Since the dye spreads out so much, I am doing a lot of of going back over areas, you know, as it dries to add even more splotches. Honestly, it takes most of the day, but I think tomorrow, once everything is dried, I will be able to get the final reveal shot of our beautiful witchy hat for our really involved Pokemon cosplay. And for our last check-in with Ash, Misty, Brock, and Pikachu, I think they just went back in time. Maybe? Maybe I'm just stupid. It seems like they went back in time at this part because we're back at the harbor. Which doesn't really make sense for literally everyone else being there, including people that weren't on the island. And I gotta say, I really love the landscape when everyone goes out to see that the storm has broken. I don't know what it is. I think it's the fact that, you know, it's still cloudy and overcast. You can still see the storm. It's not magically sunny and perfect. It just looks like the storm is passing. Ash sees Mew's little sparklies. We hear the beautiful little Mew theme. We tie it all back to the rare Pokemon Ash saw on the first day of his journey because we always got to do that this early on in the franchise. And the credits roll over a series of comedically gorgeous landscapes. I think they went a little overboard on these. At a certain point, it's like, please, you aren't hiking the Appalachian Trail. You're mostly going from town to town. Like, you're 10. Be safe. So that's the Pokemon movie.
And I'll be honest, I had some initial takeaways about the movie itself. I was really ready to talk about things like the weaknesses of the script in the third act, and things that I wanted to highlight, like the sound design and the score. But all of that really shifted once I started doing research into this movie's production, release, and reception. Reading reviews of this movie that were contemporary to the movie itself, like, I disagreed with almost everything about almost all of them. Adult saw it as such a contradiction that the Pokemon movie was about anti-violence. But for kids, the magic of Pokemon is that you just accept the premise. The premise of Pokemon is stupid. It's just magic little guys that can have wholly sentient conversations but are still somehow your pets. It's not real. It doesn't make sense. But dunking on it is like trying to look at any story about magic and being that absolute loser who gets hung up trying to find plot holes and gotchas. If you can't accept the admittedly absurd premise of Pokemon, that Pokemon exist and are all of these things at once, then of course you're never going to be able to meaningfully engage with a piece of Pokemon media. This is the basis, this is step one. If you're not down with all of this, then it's not for you and that's fine. And as I was thinking about being in that position of like getting something that the adults around me didn't get, that's a position that I have not been in for a very long time inherently because I'm 31 now. The thing that we really feel nostalgic for when we think about the Pokemon of our childhood has just as much to do with the way that our young brains just accepted new worlds like that with so much imagination. We encountered a new fictional sandbox and immediately started playing in it. I know when I make content like this video and when I cosplay from a franchise like Pokemon as I've been doing for the last few months, I run the risk of making nostalgia bait. We as grown-ups should be really critical of the way that our nostalgia can be exploited. Companies use our hunger to capture the feelings we had as children to try and sell things to us literally all the time. And there's no tidy conclusion to that. I think as people that define a lot of our lives through our experience with and relationship to fiction, we just need to keep that nuance present. And sorry, sidebar, but if we can keep that nuance present, how could adults in the 90s not understand the nuance of sometimes Pokemon battle fun and good for Pokemon and sometimes Pokemon battle to the death bad? Let's just experience nuance and complicated multiple perspectives, you guys. What I try to really focus on is not just joy that's connected to the thing, the show, the movie, but that's really focused on centering my relationship to it. The joy I got as a kid from Pokemon wasn't just Pokemon, it was who would I be in the world of Pokemon? What would my life be like if I lived in a world with Pokemon? How could I express the person that I am here and now in this reality using the rules of the world that exists in my imagination? And to be honest, that's why I make original design cosplays because it's about taking my love of something and creating something brand new with it. If you're watching this and a book or a game or a show has meant a lot to you, I hope you take that love and go out there and make something transformative. This witch hat was just a teeny part of a really massive project that I still have a lot to do on, so I should I should keep working. So I'm gonna give a truly massive thank you to Janae Pomeroy, White Rabbit Cosplay, Phantom Ace, gloop de doo Stephanie C, Eli, for Chansey Cosplay. I've gotta thank Hust and Aurelie Sos. And of course, thank you to Ryan and Toria. Your support helps keep the lights on. I'll see you tomorrow for the hat!
on, we need to do a post credit scene. Because the reason why I was so freaked out about the little kid being named Amber, you know, the scientist's daughter, is because I named my character. I named my character Amber, my eight-year-old self. Do you see that? Do you see that I was the real Amber? I was the clone child all along. Oh, I never beat my Pokedex on here. This should be... Yeah, when the music gets to this part, this should be another video. Come back soon.